Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. But, uh, so let's get started. So Emiliano is visiting us for today um, from UCL. So he's part of like. Uh, also where George Danesis is now, so they have a big security group working a lot on, on privacy and uh, crypto applications. And they're trying to actually be quite applied and implement it and take real world concerns into and into consideration. So Emiliano, he, I think in his CD, the most interesting aspect I found is that he was mostly talking with advice uh, running at the beach. So that, that must be a big difference to coming to Cambridge and uh, beautiful weather here. Um, so his t today's talk will be on collaborative uh, data sharing, and uh, yeah, so thank you, Marcio. Yeah, I was in much better shape when I was in grad school. <laughs> so my advisor will only talk to me if I went to uh, run with him Saturday morning, 7 a.m. on the beach. So. <laughs> okay, so yes, I'm at UCL, I'm a senior lecturer there, and so my uh, research really revolves around uh, privacy enhancing uh, computations, uh, and I've I've been focusing more and more on applications, as Mark Goves uh, uh, said. I've been doing a lot of work on uh, genomics privacy, and uh, we recently started working on this concept of collaborative security. So there is kind of two components in this talk. One is the generic idea of controlled data sharing, and I'm going to uh, try and explain it as, as we go along. And the second one is the specific use case a very specific use case that we are going to, uh, to present today, that's the predictive blacklisting part. Okay. So as I, as I said, our work is, um, okay, so, uh, so our work is um, kind of motivated by a recent um, um, increase in interest in the concept of collaborative security, which, you know, of course, is a very loaded term, can mean a little bit of everything, but I mean, the, the basic idea is that organizations, uh, different entities could collaborate in order to defend themselves against attackers, right? And the way to do it, it would be to, to share information about how they are attacked, right? And the idea is that if, you know, we, we could gain a better understanding of uh, the attacks out there, the vulnerabilities, and so on, so we could try to better allocate defense resources, trying to, you know, detect, block, uh, respond to, to to compromises faster and more accurately. And, you know, this is, has become a little bit of a buzzword in the past uh, maybe couple of years uh, with um, advocates that actually uh, are quite famous, includes, including the U.S. President Barack Obama. Already in January 2013 at the State of the Union Address, which is one of the most important speeches, um, you know, in, for, for a U.S. President, said that the, he wanted to push policy and initiatives um, like facilitating information sharing, uh, like threat information sharing between uh, the U.S. private sectors and the public sectors. So to, to better protect and defend against other attacks. And he actually went one step forward uh, almost two years after, so December 2014, by actually announcing um, uh, what's it called, a presidential executive order, essentially trying to push Congress to actually pass legislation uh, making this happen. Of course, you know, these days, good luck with getting anything approved by the U.S. Congress, but that's, you know, a different, uh, uh, a, a different problem. Um, there's also, you know, a number of initiatives that have recently started, again, from the U.S. government, like the Department of Homeland Security, uh, recently, I mean, maybe a couple of years ago, or now almost, uh, uh, push this uh, PREDICT initiative, uh, so really a, a repository where data could be protected and shared, um, so creating an infrastructure for data sharing. There is uh, uh, Facebook that actually launched uh, a threat exchange, which uh, uh, news websites like uh, uh, The Register quickly uh, uh, called the social networks of CISOs. Um, which are very simple uh, tools, and then there is also others like Bomba and Chris, that allow um, CISOs and security professionals to share information about threats. There's also for-profit organizations like the Red Sky, Sky Alliance, 
which actually um, you know, kind of facilitates uh, all the legal aspects for organizations to come together, sign non-disclosure agreements, and negotiate terms of dealership. Okay. So unfortunately, these, these initiatives are faced with a number of problems. Um, you know, the first one that comes comes into mind from you know privacy researcher point of view is is actually privacy and confidentiality. Is that even if even if this information only relates about threats and attacks, it can actually expose sensitive or confidential information. For instance, you know, by looking at how um, a service provider is attacked, you could maybe understand who their customers are, or what kind of uh, systems they're running, maybe learn some information about you know, their customers, uh, some vulnerabilities, and, and so on. Uh, there's also kind of a liability issue in the sense that I can maybe find out that my, in my university, it took them two years to fix the heart rate bug, right? and they could be actually held accountable for that. Uh, when you talk to CISOs, you notice also the other kind of concerns, like trust, the fact that you know these organizations don't really trust each other, and so what happens is they they, they have to resort to this kind of red sky alliance initiatives, uh, where essentially you establish a circle of trust where you promise each other not to share information outside the circle of trust, uh, where you have all sort of legal protection, and this obviously hinders uh, economy of scale and speediness because by the time you you put this mechanism in place, the data is obsolete. Uh, there's also competitive concerns, right? So how you know the organizations that are maybe in the same sector, you know, maybe they don't really want to help each other. Anyway, so our our uh, generic idea is to explore how we can uh, enable uh, this collaborative threat mitigation following a controlled data sharing approach. Again, it's sort of a loaded term, and, but I hope that uh, it will become clear in in, in a few slides. So we're, essentially, we want to follow a data minimization approach where you know, we, we seek a middle ground between sharing everything, so organizations, they come together, uh, they hug each other and share all the data that they have, or share nothing, which are essentially the two approaches that we have available right now. Right? So, and more, more precisely, we like to design tools that help our, these organizations make informed decisions. So whether or not to share, whether or not to collaborate, and you know, in case they decide to do so, what exactly to share and how much. Right? So the idea will be really to, to guide this decision based on some estimate that this will actually be useful, and we could actually try and model both the usefulness and the risks of you know, disclosing data, all these uh, liability, competitive uh, concerns, and so on. So this is sort of like a generic, generic uh, um, uh, intuition, but we'll actually explore this intuition, as I said, in a very specific use case, which is collaborative predictive blacklisting. Um, so predictive blacklisting is uh, really just a simple, essentially machine learning um, uh, algorithm that will allow you to forecast attack sources based on a model that you trained uh, using the past. Right? So the collaboration in this setting means that you, know, you, you perform this forecast, you perf perform this prediction based not only on your, on your past, not only on, let's say, on your logs, but also on, that, uh, on those that you get from other organizations. Right? Um, so and this is actually something that, um, that happens already today. There are some uh, volunteer-run uh, initiatives like this shield where small organizations and universities contribute logs uh, about attacks. Well, they're usually uh, logs um, derived by, from, from intrusion detection systems. They upload it to, to a repository called DShield, for instance, and the DShield um, server will compute this prediction for you. Okay? So by, based on all these aggregate logs. Okay? So how do we, we want to go about it? is, as I mentioned, we want to you know, follow a data minimization approach where we shouldn't share information if it's not going to be useful. Right? So what we need to do as the first step is provide organizations with tools to estimate the benefit of sharing. And the second, second step would be, okay, based on this estimate, now let's establish partnership. Let's, let's say we have a probable cause 
we, we have some, some indication that it's going to be useful for us to share, so we share, okay? And that's kind of our last step. Okay, naturally, we, we need to do this, what, uh, as I said, with, with privacy, otherwise there will be no point, right? So we need to provide tools to estimate the benefit of share, sharing without actually disclosing the, the entire data set. Otherwise, there will be really no point in, in doing that in the first place. <clears throat> and uh, this is going to be one of the, uh, the key challenges that we're going to, uh, to address. And uh, the other one is also like, you know, once we, we have assessed that it's going to be useful for us to partner and we do establish a partnership, what we actually are going to share. Right, so we need to, to provide tools that allow us to share only what's intended to, and again, what's useful. Okay. So now let's, let's zoom in and, and try to understand a little bit better what we're trying to do. So the first step, I said, is estimating the benefits. So our, the question from a research point of view is, how do we do that? How do we estimate what, what are good indicators, what kind of metrics we can run to understand whether or not sharing will be beneficial? So, you know, just uh, um, common things that you could think of. Okay, maybe if we have a lot of attackers in common, uh, probably, you know, that would be useful if we collaborate or if we are attacked in similar ways or our attacks are correlated with each other, maybe this is a good indication that sharing information would be useful for us. So we are going to, to experiment with, with, with all these approaches and see what happens. So the second step is how do I, yes? Two questions, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so my question is like, um, this general framework of deciding when to share information, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's also useful in, in, in business settings potentially, you know, like mm -hmm. Google and Facebook may decide that they sometimes want to share some of the information and mm -hmm. when to figure that out. And, yeah. and so did you look at that as well? Or did you, uh, Not really at this point. But, um, so we are working on, on other applications as well, and actually, I think there is a, a whole area to be explored here that kind of um, take into account also kind of game theoretical approaches, like making a decision based on, you know, cost utility. Right? So here we focus more on understanding how to, uh, to estimate the utility of, of sharing, but not really how to model these decisions. So that's... So I, I actually have a more basic question. When you say that, uh, suppose two parties, they have uh, mm -hmm. a large number of attackers in common, then what would be the actual benefit of sharing the data from both, both sides? Right? Because the, yeah. how much additional information is each of the party gaining? They already yeah. know the set of attackers. So, this is the knowledge of the machine learning algorithm that is going to do the prediction. So, you know, maybe you've seen an attack only a couple of times and the machine learning algorithm, I'm oversimplifying, the algorithm will not think that this attacker is going to attack you again. Okay, so but it's if, going to increase the yeah, accuracy of yes, the prediction. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's, it probably will become clear when I show how we do the prediction. Um, yeah, so the second step is, you know, once, let's say I have uh, N possible partners that I can collaborate with, how do I choose which one uh, um, actually to establish a partnership with. Like, again, based on, on these benefits, but what kind of uh, strategies are better to, uh, are best uh, to go about it. So we don't really consider this in this work, but you know, you could think of, let's say if I have N possible partners, I will try and partner with the top K, where top is defined as, you know, again, the output of the benefit estimation. Or you could try it to say, okay, if the benefit, estimated benefit, is above a certain threshold, then I establish some partnership. Or maybe I can follow a hybrid approach. So we don't consider this in this, in this work, also because, you know, the benefit estimation is not very symmetrical, right? So, you know, I might have a, a really good uh, uh, increase in uh, prediction accuracy by sharing with Markov, but Markov will not, right? So this is kind of an open problem that again, as I said, is, is going to be uh, evaluated in some sort of game theoretical approach. So the third step, which we do consider, is once we partner up, so we have two, 
let's say two or more organizations decide to share information with each other, what should they share? Should they share everything or just what they have in common? Or, you know, again, should they share information only about um, attacks or also some metadata? So if I've seen an attack, should I just tell you the IP address of this, of this attacker or also, you know, time, uh, um, port number, protocol, and other things? And again, we'll experiment with, with, with these things. So our goal, in a nutshell, is to test the improvement in the, predict, in the prediction accuracy thanks to this controlled data sharing. So, you know, as I said, we'll, we'll try and, and see how much uh, controlled data sharing makes us improve compared to not share everything and also compared to share, to share everything. So before we switch gear and we actually present the results of our experiment, let me introduce some, some basic notation. So we'll consider a network of n entities, and each entity i holds a data set s high of suspicious events. So these are events in the form of, for us, IP address, time, and port number, as observed by a firewall on an intrusion detection system. And we do this because that's the data that we, we get. Um, so we will experiment, as I said, with these different uh, uh, different applications, right? So, uh, to, in order to estimate benefits, we will experiment with uh, metrics like the size of the intersection, so how many attacks this uh, entity I and entity J have, or the similarity of these data sets, uh, like Pearson, uh, cosine similarity, and so on. Um, so now, based on the output of this estimation, uh, the entities will decide whether or not to, to partner up. Uh, as I mentioned, sorry, I don't know why this became, became a bug, but this, <laughs> this was just a stop sign, okay? So you can decide whether or not to, to, to share, whether or not to partner up, and then uh, you can actually share. So you merge your data sets, you could you know, either merge everything, so you get the union of the two data sets, or you just share what you have in common, so just the intersection. Now, as I mentioned, we actually want to do this in a privacy-preserving way. So, you know, the fact I, I should be able to estimate these benefits without revealing the data sets itself. Otherwise, what's the point? Right? And, you know, likely uh, a number of people have done a lot of work uh, in secure computation. So there, is, uh, there are many ways to, uh, to actually run all these, all these uh, functions here uh, in a privacy-preserving way, which means without revealing the data itself, but just revealing the output of the function, right? So there, there's been a lot of uh, progress in, in this area, both using general two-party computation like garbage circuits or via specialized protocols. It's not really the focus of, of our work, uh, but you know, just we need to know that these things exist and are efficient. Okay. I, I'm gonna give you some back of the envelope um, kind of estimation of how long it would take to run these protocols at the end at the end of the talk. So cool, we can do that. And we can also support this kind of privacy preserving data sharing. Uh, so if I only want to share the intersection of these data sets, I can do that. There is a protocol for that. I can use garbled circuits. Um, if I also want to share uh, like kind of the meta the metadata, the associated data, so not only the IPs that are in common, but also at what times they, they appear in my logs, what ports they attack. I can do that, again, in a privacy-preserving way. Uh, okay, if I want to share everything, then okay, there is no privacy. <laughs> but uh, I just add this line in this table because we are going to experiment that what's the difference in terms of the prediction accuracy between like sharing everything and just sharing this intersection. Okay, so now let's see what we've done, really. So far, it's just an introduction. <laughs> So we're going to use a, a real data set, which we obtained by DShield. <clears throat> I mentioned this, uh, uh, this service before. It's a, it's a voluntary-based run uh, uh, framework, where, uh, sorry, server, where different organizations, mostly um, small businesses and universities or just regular people, contribute data in this form. Okay? So, um, the DShield data set is actually publicly available. Uh, you just have to sign up and then you can actually crawl it. They will give you 
uh, entries in this form. So you get an anonymized uh, uh, information for the target. So essentially, it's the, the organization that contributed that entry. Uh, and I, I think this is an HMAC of the IP address of, of, of the victim, of the contributor. Okay? So this is, a, this is a pseudonym, which is actually constant. So you can link different contributions by the same target. Does it, does it use some secret uh, salt? Uh, I'm sorry? Does it use a secret salt, hopefully? Or? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, okay, then you, you get the IP address of the attacker, so the source, um, uh, the source of the attack, the target port, uh, the protocol, there is, we actually don't look at the protocol, but you, you can get it, uh, and date and time. So we crawled this data for about two months, so and we and we obtain about two billion attacks, so two billion entries in kind of in this table. We have 16 million unique uh, attackers and 800,000 unique targets, and on average we 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 observe about 200 attacks per day per target. Yes. Also, how do you know if the post is from a legitimate party? I'm sorry. How do you know if the post is from a legitimate? No, we don't know. We can't, we can't really guarantee. But there has been some prior work using this data, looking at this data, measuring this data, and you know, if you filter out, uh, and we do filter out a little bit of noise, this is, um, you know, you can fairly assume that that's legitimate, uh, sort of legitimate stuff. So it could be abused for, for denial of service attacks that you try to Convince the shield that yeah, like, yeah, you Microsoft is a, is yeah, a you website. Yeah, you could. Yeah, but um, I mean, that's not really the, the goal of our uh, of our work. So we don't really want to design like a new uh, anomaly detection or uh, predi prediction. We just want to measure uh, the difference between you know this kind of control data sharing versus sharing everything and versus sharing nothing. Yeah, um, yeah so it's a little bit hard for us to get data uh, from like service providers, you need to get it from multiple sources. So it's kind of interesting, I mean, uh, without mentioning any particular company, but, you know, some company actually had agreed to give us data, but, you know, we had, we need to get data from multiple companies in order for this to, to work. And when they heard that they were we were going to merge data with other companies, they said no. Like, okay. Anyway, <clears throat> so, uh, okay, this is like a large chunk of data that we get and uh, just to give you a visualiz visualization of, of like some basic statistics so we as I said two months or so 60 days as you can see the number of attacks that, that are collected by the shield kind of fluctuates a lot uh, so we have some days where there's not too many and some other days where there's probably a denial service attack going on and the, we have a spike here okay so we have to somewhat clean this data first in order to, to use it. So we, among other things, we, we do uh, other things following prior work, but mostly the, the, the kind of cleaning, the process that we do is to remove uh, targets that on, report data only for one day. Okay? So we get everything, all the, um, we discard all these entries for which you have a target um, reporting only one day, and we go actually from 800,000 targets to almost 200,000 targets. Then what we're going to do is gonna, we're going to select uniformly at random 100 victims, um, a thousand times, so uh, a thousand different using, you know, uh, we'll, we'll select a hundred different, most likely, uh, victims using a thousand random iterations. And from these 100 victims, we are going to experiment uh, with our data sharing approach and measure, measure the prediction. Okay? So we remember I said there is a network of n entities. So now n equals 100 in this setting. And we're going to experiment in a pairwise setting uh, all, all, all of these tools. Right? So, and what I mean is we're going to, uh, to drive the sharing approach using different benefit estimations, so size of the intersection, chakra similarity, cosine similarity, and so on. And then we, are, so as I said, we don't really experiment with different partner selection strategies. 
we always select the top 50 pairs out of the 4,950 possible pairs uh, based on the benefit estimation. So we use the output of, those, of that function directly as the way to establish a, a partnership. Okay? So we will always select the top 50. So, okay? And then we also experiment with different merging strategies, like sharing the union or the intersection. Any questions? So how do you deal with the asymmetry in the, in the benefit? We don't. Yeah, so, so we don't. So uh, you assume that even if it's not beneficial for me, I will yes. share with you if it's yeah. beneficial for you? Yeah, we do that. <laughs> okay, so, um, and as I mentioned, you know, we actually we see that this data is in line with other uh, blacklisting and um, anomaly detection work that has been done before, also on other data sets not just digital. So you can see that you can observe essentially two, uh, two phenomena. So on the, here on the x-axis we put the targets, on the y-axis we put the sources. So these are the victims, these are the attackers. As you can see there are like some really clear horizontal lines, which means that there are like attackers that attack everybody. Right? So those are usually like targets, scanners, they try and attack everybody. And you also see some vertical lines, which means that there are some targets that are essentially attacked by a lot of, of attackers, uh, which probably means there is a botnet or uh, a denial of service going on to, on this target. And this actually, we observe it constantly for different weeks, uh, but you know, as you can see, they're kind of different, sorry, they're, they're different uh, species. Okay, so there, if you, we, we actually got really excited, we did a bunch of measurements, so if you, you, you can read in the paper uh, more information about that, also kind of to, to, to have some, some uh, idea of what was going on, that helps us actually understand how the different strategies change because of the data itself. Okay, <clears throat> okay so now, um, one more thing that I have to, uh, to explain to you, how we do the prediction. There are more, many possible ways where you can actually predict future attacks based on the past, but the state of the art seemed to be, at the time of our research, uh, a, essentially a simple time series approach, an exponentially weighted moving average, where you look at the past, so we, we will look at the past five days, and we're going to try and predict a sixth day. Okay? And so the time series is quite simple. Uh, the way you do it, again, it's an exponentially weighted moving average. Um, so I don't want to go too much in the details of this, but it's quite simple. There is a couple of things that I want to point out. The first one is that in this time series prediction, you have a smoothing uh, coefficient, like a, um, a, a weight factor, alpha, so a number from 0 to 1, which actually affects the output of the, of the prediction. So we're going to experiment uh, with this, ex um, you know, empirically. But you know, what? How how do we set this this data? Uh, so this parameter, as I said, it depends on, uh, on on our data. But if you essentially if you put it close to zero, at zero point one, means that you give a lot of memory to your algorithm. If you put it zero point nine, means that you're kind of discarding everything that is not very recent. Okay. So now, this is the, the vector of attacks that you're going to use to, to perform the prediction. And data sharing um, affects this. So if you do your, the prediction only based on your own logs, then this vector only has this, your, own, your own logs. But if you do the sharing, then you augment this vector also with partner's logs. Okay? And that's what we are going to experiment with. So as I said, we have to set this value of alpha. I don't want to spend too much time, but this is in line with prior work. Uh, you can see on the y-axis here, the average uh, sum of true positives, so the average sum across all victims of correct predictions. As you can see, it kind of reaches a steady state of you know, about 0.5. So I think a good setting for, for alpha is 0.5. So you, know, you, you look at the past, but you give it you know, you look, the far past has, will have a little bit less weight than 
the, the, far, the, the, the recent bus. Okay, so now, first, uh, first set of results. We're going to look at how the prediction is affected by the different uh, benefit estimation strategies. Okay? So as I said, we, we're always going to consider the top 50 pairs. And so here we take a kind of a conservative approach and we say, okay, we, these top 50 pairs are going to share only the intersection with, with the associated data. So not share everything, just uh, information about common attacks. It doesn't change much, actually, this graph when you put the union. So this graph tells us what is the average sum of true positives. So the average sum of correct predictions. So the blue line is the baseline, which is you know no no sharing. Okay, you do it by yourself. And then we look at different strategies. So you can see the top line, the green line, is the intersection size. So it turns out that you you improve uh, the uh, the accuracy of your prediction if you share based on how many attacks you have in common. And this is kind of a very conservative approach, you know, only share what you have in common, only top 50 pairs, or so 1% of all possible pairs, but, you know, that's kind of shows us something, uh, especially when you compare with the different strategies. Like, personally, I, I would have said similarity would work better, or correlation, but it turns out it doesn't. Yes? How do you know if a uh, source is a true positive or not? Oh, okay, yeah, because the D-Shield data set, we use it also as a kind of ground truth data. So if it's reported on the sixth day um, as an attacker, then we say, okay, we, we did the prediction correctly. So as I said, we look, we look at the five past days, and then we try to predict the, the next day. And we do this for a week. So we have kind of a moving uh, moving. Did you look at false positives? Yes, so this can be couple of slides. So uh, just to zoom in on improvement, so here we define improvement as the number of correct prediction minus the number of um, uh, minus the number of um, sorry, okay, sorry, the number of correct predictions using sharing minus the number of correct predi prediction without sharing over the number of correct of correct prediction without sharing. So as you can see, on average, we, we, we always improve by sharing. Uh, and sometimes we improve like seven, eight times. Um, sometimes we don't improve, right? Uh, and uh, so the, the other interesting thing to notice is that, you know, by, by driving the, um, the collaboration via these different benefit estimation metrics, you end up selecting different partners, right? So, uh, because we always select these top 50 pairs, you know, what happens is that, you know, you can have very different uh, entities in these pairs or less different pairs. So we, we kind of have this concept of coalition size. I, I don't want to spend too much time, but this kind of helps us explain in the paper also why we think that different metrics uh, behave differently. Mostly is that in the way we do the prediction here, uh, by adding uh, more um, more views about the specific attacks will actually help us uh, predict better because we kind of reinforce the knowledge about something that was an attack. Okay. Um, okay. So and in fact, we actually try to 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 look at the correlation between the number of events which are on the x axis in log scale. Um, so the events known known by by targets, known by victims, and their ability to predict to predict uh, attacks. Right. So, the, okay, the blue curve curve shows a linear regression, but essentially we, we can we can say that there is a, a, a high correlation between knowing more and being more successful at attacks. Right? So I mean that kind of explains uh, a little bit, which is. Kind of encouraging you know, from our point of view. You can say, okay, look, we're doing something very simple. We are not optimizing much how to, to, to actually uh, do the prediction, how to form partnerships. But in reality, we can we can say that the more you know about attacks, the better you predict. Right? So on the other hand, you can expect, yeah, but what about false positives? Right? Maybe the more you know, the more mistakes you make. Right? 
So what we do is to look at the false positive rates and compare it to the true positive rate. So false, po false positive rate is the number of false positives over the number of false positives plus the number of true negatives. Right? And the true positive rate is the number of true positives over the number of true positives plus uh, false negatives. Right? So in theory, you like everything to be on the upper left corner. Right? So you want small false positive rates, very high true positive rates. Right? OK, so this graph is maybe it's not the best graph I've ever drawn. But as you can see, the baseline, we, we have it about here. Okay, And the, the sharing approach, actually, we have it on the left of this baseline, which means that our false positive rates actually goes down, and while the true positive goes, goes higher. Okay? So of a little bit, but that's encouraging, right? Which means that actually sharing Helps, uh, helps me make less mistakes, fewer mistakes, right? Because actually now I can, I, I have better knowledge. Okay? Again, this is uh, the first result, can be way optimized, and it's encouraging, right? Yes? But, so if it's okay that your true positive rate is 0 0.09, which is still, say, lesser than your false positive rate, which is like 0.2, uh, yeah. So, so how, how useful is that? Yeah, that's um, okay. So the this is a common to essentially all these predictive like this thing. Okay. So when you when you try to, to 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 predict and you put something in a blacklist, you don't actually block all traffic, right? So you you essentially um, I would say the a better term for this would be gray listing, in the sense that you have an IP address that maybe as a firewall you only allow outgoing connections and not incoming connections. So even if you have like a sort of a high false positive rate, doesn't mean that you know your provider will stop working. You know, it means that you're going to scrutinize a little bit more uh, IP like connections from those IP addresses. So prediction will will have a high false positive rate, that's for sure. Okay. So how exactly do you determine a false positive? So is it is it just to predict the an attack for the sixth day and it doesn't occur or stay? Yeah, so for the positive for us is if we make a prediction that it's going to appear again in the additional log for that victim. And well, if it doesn't appear, that's, that's a false positive. Do you also fix it only on the sixth day leg for the true positive or? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> okay so the other, um, the other plot that I want to show here is this block, box plot of uh, number of events known by by collaborators. So a number of, of of events that you know these partners see, and so you can see again we just compare uh, the different structure the, the the different strategies, and the intersection size uh, you know gives us a, a better uh, like you you kind of know a little bit more about attacks. So you kind of expand expand your view a little bit. Um, and so this. Uh, um, helps us, I mean, actually helps us clarify why Jacker similarity doesn't work very well, because you actually don't enhance your knowledge that much. Okay, so the other, the, other, the last thing left to experiment is uh, the, the merging strategy, so what you actually share. Right? So here we, we again experiment with the different benefit estimations. We get the top 50 pairs. And then we look at the average improvement, uh, sharing everything, so the union, or sharing only um, only the, the, the intersection, right? So for intersection size, uh, we, we lose, but a little bit, right? Not much. For the other for the other size, you actually gain. So it means that you know it, it, the sharing everything kind of confuses the algorithm even more. So we we are better off. Uh, actually sharing only the subset, so sharing only the intersection. Again, this is sort of encouraging for us because it means actually we don't need to share everything. We just need to share what's useful. Okay, what we have in common that seems to enhance our, our prediction. Okay, so I promise I would give like some back of the envelope uh, calculation. How long would it 
would this take if we use these privacy enhancing technologies? Okay? So mostly we are looked at ways to compute the intersection and the size of the intersection, what we really need. And so right now protocols are very, very fast. So we can do, in one second, we can do a private set intersection with 1,000 items. So 1,000 1, attacks on commodity hardware. Okay? So you know, even if you, again, in, in our setting, we have 100 entities. So you might, in this pairwise setting where we're operating at the moment, you need to interact with you know, 99 other organizations. So you know, even if you do, you can, you know, you can complete the whole interaction in you know, 100 seconds, right? less, than two, less than two minutes. Right? So you know, considering that you, you will run these protocols maybe once a day, it's not that bad. Right? So it's a reasonable performance. We can actually operate in real time even more than once a day. <clears throat> okay. So as a conclusion, um, you know, the, the kind of lessons that, that we can take from this very uh, preliminary um, exploration of this problem is that knowing more means predicting more, so sharing is a good thing, but we don't have to really share everything. Actually, in some cases, uh, sharing only common attackers is almost as good as sharing everything. And I, you know, I can only share with organizations that have these common attackers with me. And I can find out whether organizations have common attackers without really disclosing my data using these protocols, like set intersection, garbage circuits, and And as I said, controlling, control data sharing also reduces a little bit, but it does reduce the false positive rates. And so, you know, other kind of potential use cases of, of, of this that we, we are considering now is like in the healthcare setting. So, if, you know, these strategies could help different organizations collaborate and perform research, you know, for drug interactions, treatment plans, uh, discovering new diseases and other things. Of course, also in finance, marketing, so you can track transactions across different institutions. You can, you know, gather more information and do collaborative marketing and so on. We're working with, in transport as well, like how we, we manage to, to share information about different transportation means, um, uh, also, you know, in the government and, 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 and other things. But those are just, just ideas to, um, that, that we, we are exploring right now. Okay, so this concludes my talk. If you have any questions, uh, I'll be really happy to, to answer them. How do you actually determine what data you, you really need to share? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, as a, you just said there are two extremes. Share everything or share less, but how do you determine? Right, so I mean, it depends on, uh, my current answer is that it depends on the application. Right? Right, sure. So in, the, in this like predictive blacklisting, turns out that we discovered that what we really need to share is common information about common attacks. That's that's kind of like the takeaway of this of this work. Right. So I need to find organizations that are attacked by the same attackers and I should share information about these attacks. This helps us a lot. Almost as much as you know sharing everything with everybody. So but yeah. this information needs to be pro uh, provided from the result of this first step, right? Uh, yeah. Computing the yeah. So yeah, exactly. So I first we count how many attacks we have in common. If that's that's a lot, I mean I'm oversimplifying, then we share them. Like not just the count, but actually what are these attacks that we have in common. So you, so you did look at because you, you, your baseline was kind of only using local data. So yeah. you also look at the other extreme where you yeah, we do. Yes, with everyone. So what yeah, was the result we do. for that? So we're kind of in the middle between the mm -hmm. two things. Yeah. So in the paper uh, we have a bunch of other graphs, yeah. But I mean, there's also the. I mean, there's also like another uh, line of work is in optimizing the prediction itself. Right? right now, we're just using what what DShield has been using. Uh, so they actually do this plus some clustering. Right? They get data from uh, from 
different entities, they cluster them together using some KNN based approach, and then they do this prediction, time series prediction on, on the clusters. That's what they do. But in this setting where you actually don't need the cluster, maybe this algorithm is not the best. Right. And so we could do even better the prediction. Yeah, but we're in a way, you also do a cluster. Now you take the fifty. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. yeah. We do some kind of manual, <laughs> manual cluster. Right? Yeah, true. Yeah. But so yeah, as I said before, we're actually looking at um, uh, other approaches, like for instance, using random forest. Um, it's a little bit more expensive computationally to to run, but we have some some good uh, preliminary results. In, 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 in that. Yeah. Okay, we, we need to change a little bit uh, the strategy. You know, random forest is actually a classification problem, right? So we need to to turn around the prediction and make it like a classification. So you know, you have an IP address and you try to classify: is this going to attack me or not? So it's it's a little bit different in the machine learning. My colleagues are much more expert than me. <laughs> How does this benefit measures help in the decision whether you should share metadata or not? Um, so, for the way the prediction is done, um, we need what we really need in terms of metadata is the time when, like, your, your partner has seen this attack, because you know if he, if he had seen it like a little bit further in the past, uh, the way that uh, exponentially weighted average will actually make it count less than if you had seen it uh, more recently. Right. No, but if, uh, for the set intersection, the counting the number of intersections will not affect the decision whether you should share the metadata. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't... I mean, so the decision that you would make from this benefit measures is whether to share or not. Yeah. It's not whether to share metadata. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no, no. Yeah. Sure. We just experiment, yeah, yeah. What, okay. what you should do. So how helpful is this blacklisting approach in general? So as an attacker, I can restart my router and I get a new IP address, and this is what you use to blacklist me. I'm sorry, say again? So, so as an attacker, I can restart my router and I will uh -huh. get a new IP address, so I... Yeah, so that's... Uh, or I use Tor or whatever, so... Yeah, so that will work for, you know, targeted attacks, right? But on, you know, on large-scale attackers, for large-scale attacks, that's not really the case. So it would cost you to, to get a new IP address, right? And that's, you know, what all research in like anomaly detection, intrusion detection, always count on. So these algorithms are public, right? So you can try, the attackers could, in theory, deviate so that, you know, your prediction doesn't catch him anymore. Or, as you said, they can change IP address, but it will cost them money. So, they, you know, some will do, but the majority of them won't because... They don't have, I mean, either they don't have the resources or then will cost too much, then the attack itself will not make sense anymore. You know what I mean? So, <clears throat> but yeah, that's a, that's a common for all this algorithm. So. And you, so for example, it might be useful if you had more information on the IP addresses so that you could blacklist whole IP subnet, subnets or something. Mm -hmm. But this yeah. is something you cannot do with this data because of the hashing? Or? Right. So, uh, no, the hashing is done on the victim side, not on the attacker ah, okay. side. Right. So the attacker IP is plain invisible in this yeah. database. So actually, we thought about it, and um, um, we decided not to do it, uh, because from prior work, it seems that you don't really have to. It seems like, you know, just for instance, restricting subnets doesn't help you that much. So it actually, I mean, it does, but then it also increases false positives a lot, right? So usually, where you have seen from the papers from which, on which we build on, we, we just follow their approach not to consider the submit. Any more questions? Yeah, so uh, Emiliano will be around. Uh, I don't know, how, when is your train? You well, I don't know, I haven't really decided, so I can say. Early evening, yeah. and yeah, if you want to talk. It's on the fourth floor. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thanks again.